everybody, it's Kevin Raber and welcome to Photo Chats. Uh, it's November 6, 2024, the day after the election. And um, maybe that's why we don't have as many people as we usually do here. I guess all of us are processing things uh, in one way or another. And um, <clears throat> I know I've, I've had kind of a rough day myself, but we're going to move on and get life going again. So I'm happy that you're here. Uh, if, if I can make my slideshow work, there it goes. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, the, what we've got coming up. Uh, November 20th, Drew Hendricks is coming back. He didn't make the first one that he was scheduled for, and we kind of had a free-for-all day. Um, um, your but, calendar uh, is not showing. It's not. Are you not seeing anything? I'm seeing, I'm seeing November 6th. Huh. That's weird. I'm going to stop, share, and reshare, see what happens. Yeah. <sighs> How do you see it now? I see guest today, Kevin Raber. There it is. Yeah, now it works. All right, good. So we have uh, November 20th um, with Drew Hendricks from Red River Paper. That's going to be an interesting talk about <clears throat> the paper industry for printing and um, how he's kind of found his own niche amongst the, a lot of the uh, photographers and uh, is pretty much one of the go-to paper companies for what we do. Uh, Carl Corey will be with us on December 4th. He's got amazing photography. Many of you know who he is. And of course, John Barclay, um, pretty cool guy. i uh, known him for a long time. He'll be with us on December 18th is our, our last uh, visitor. We won't have uh, another event in December and uh, I'll share the January schedule with everybody when we meet again on the 20th. Um, your hosts for this program are Jeff Shiwi, who is not with us today. Uh, he's out gallivanting around somewhere doing what Jeff does. Uh, myself, Kevin Raber, John Cornicello, who I always like to give credit to that uh, the photo chats programs that we do here would not be uh, in existence today if it wasn't for what John did during the uh, pandemic. He, he saved a lot of us as we were in lockdown. And Holger Mischke from Germany, a uh, good partner, does a lot of cool stuff. And uh, we do have a program that he's done. You can find that on the photopxl.com website under the videos or on the YouTube channel for PhotoPXL. Um, I got a little bit workshop announcements here. I've got five fine art printing workshops scheduled for next year. I have a Faroe Islands workshop scheduled for May 17th to the 24th. Um, we're actually doing two out there, but one of them is a private one. Then uh, I have my two Palouse workshops I do every year with only five people. Uh, that is in June 16th, and another one starting on June 23rd. If you've never been to the Palouse uh, and you want to take landscape photographs, uh, you'll walk away with hundreds of beautiful, beautiful images. It's uh, the Tuscany of America, and we love doing that. And then I love doing the harvest. Uh, this year I'm not going to Greenland like I normally do in August, so I'm starting the August workshops back up for the harvest, which uh, if you go in the summertime, it's all green, and you go in the harvest, it's a gold and it's a very dynamic landscape as the farmers in the area uh, harvest their wheat. A uh, very, very cool place to visit. Um, a couple rules, if you all know them already, but we'll be muting everybody. Uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, John will be watching that. Um, and if there's anything that's uh, a question, then he'll interrupt where he needs to be. Uh, then we'll unmute everybody's microphones if they want to ask any questions at the, at the end. So um, I'm Kevin Raber, and I'm going to switch screens over to the next screen, hopefully, and we'll begin our little presentation. Does everybody see the uh, Rust screen now? John? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we're good Your to session. go. <clears throat> so anyway, this is... Um, I wanted to share um, some one of my my uh, obsessions, uh, which is rust and the photographing rust around the world. It's one of my many projects I'm working on. So uh, let's get into it. So I'm a rustaholic. Uh, my journey began uh, many many years ago, and I just kind of developed a passion for rusty things. Um, today we'll be looking at something a bit different. It's one of my projects. Um, 
if you have any questions, you can always email me, and that's for most of the people that might be watching this on a recording. Of course, you can go to visit photopxl.com and Rock Hopper Workshops, Raver Eyes, and all the different websites I have, which are on the screen there. Um, photography has been my passion for life. It's what I do. It's what I've been doing as long as I can remember. I had a very large studio at one time in my life, and I also uh, had developed a software company that wrote some of the very first photography software for the Mac. I ended up selling all those, went to run a big color lab, and from there I went to become a vice president and owner of Phase One. And then when I left Phase One, I ended up running the Luminous Landscape website, and uh, then I created my own PhotoPXL.com, and uh, also developed a workshop program with Rock Hopper Workshops, with workshops around the world. And uh, recently, within the last year or two, I became a residence artist in residence at the Indianapolis Art Center. And along with that privilege, I got a giant studio to work with, which I teach printing, mobile photography, and other courses there, plus holds printing workshops there. Uh, it's quite the, the cool place. I'm a regular kind of guy. I love my cats. I love my dog. Um, dog is Maggie. My, that cat there is named Ansel. And uh, they're very, very special and makes our household uh, filled with a lot of love as we have three cats that are really cool. And then Maggie, who, who's just an incredible dog. And... Uh, uh, one of the best friends you could ask for. And of course, I got my wife, Deborah, and uh, you can see here we, we just, we're doing a story about uh, giving uh, PXL a, a chance or photo PXL with peace. And we kind of emulated the famous um, um, John Lennon and Oko. John and Yoko. Yep. So, and Maggie decided she needed to get in the picture. So there, there's the kind of fun we have in doing what we do. But I'm an adventurer at heart. Um, I, Last couple of years, I haven't traveled as much as I normally do, and I sometimes feel the pain, but I know I feel the pain every time I come home from an adventure these days. I don't know whether it's older, it's just a sign of times, but it's, uh, you know, what's happening. Uh, the ship in the upper left corner was the one I used just about a year ago on uh, the trip to Antarctica, and the bottom picture there, the iceberg, probably the, the best iceberg picture and the most unusual iceberg uh, ever saw on one of my very first trips back uh, in the early 2000s uh, to Antarctica, quite the the spectacle, and I had became very, very passionate about Antarctica, and that's where I discovered my rust, um, and when you're looking at the top right-hand corner is a picture of an old abandoned whaling station on South Georgia Island, so um, it, you know, it's been pretty pretty special. Um, I have been, and I'm recovering uh, gas uh, gear acquisition syndrome, uh, person. I've kind of narrowed my cameras down to two Sony cameras, uh, the A7R and the A1, which I think A1 is probably one of the finest cameras I've ever owned. I have a bunch of lenses you can see there from wide angle all the way up to the 600 millimeter, uh, an 85 and a 90 millimeter uh, prime, which uh, the 90 millimeter macro from Sony is just an incredibly sharp lens. I also have a Sony RX10 5 or V as they call it. I'm doing a story on that as a bridge camera. And then the Sony RX106, which is just one of those cameras that you can't figure out how they put so much in a tiny little camera that you can put in your pocket. I also own uh, the Fuji 106X106, uh, uh, which is kind of my Leica uh, go-to camera. It's a rangefinder, very, very popular, still on back order everywhere. And then we also have in the APS-C side of things an X-H2 and an X-T5. Those are uh, used a lot by Deborah, my wife, and uh, a whole bunch of lenses that we have with it. Uh, both Deborah and I need to get out and do some more photography. We used to do those at least once a month on a trip, and life has kind of gotten in front of us lately, so uh, we need to try to get back out there, and I encourage all of you to get back out there and photograph as much as you can. Of course, I also have my iPhone, which is an amazing camera, especially the iPhone uh, 16 uh, Max Pro. Uh, 248 millimeter or 48 uh, megapixel uh, lenses or sensors in that camera and they do an amazing job. Um, I've done a lot of articles on my site about that, especially with how big you can make the prints from it. It's pretty cool. Uh, don't forget I have uh, PhotoPXL as a website, Rockhopper Workshops as a website, um, KevinRaber.com, which is my blog work site, work, work, uh, website, and then the storefront, which is Raver Eyes, which I'm about to uh, remodel, and I'm going to be using and started uh, designing a new one in Squarespace. So 
somewhere as I can find the hours, I'll finish that up and have a, a new shopping site for my photography on uh, Squarespace. So look for that sometime in the next few months, hopefully. <clears throat> There's the websites. So it, one of the things that uh, this Rust came out of is projects. Um, having photographed a lot with Art Wolf and ran running a lot of workshops with Art, uh, I always saw that he was working on five or six books at one time. And some of those books were to be published in four or five years, but he was collecting images along the way and considers each one of the books a project. And I think we've talked about that in some articles that I've written, but I think we need projects, projects that you know might be long term that allow us to build up a, a, a collection of images. And so my projects that I've been working on for a long time are icebergs. Um, that would come naturally out of visiting both the uh, Arctic and Antarctica area. And then there's a, uh, an abandoned city on Salvbard, which is a, one of the furthest islands north in, uh, you can go to. And there's an abandoned city, uh, old Russian city called Pyramid. Uh, it was a coal mine city. And one day they just packed up all the boats and left everything as it is. There's hotels and schools and theaters and all sorts of things there. And they're trying to revive it. Uh, quite an interesting place to visit. Um, then I've been working on the project about the immensity of Greenland, one of these beautiful places I've been to a number of times now. But everything in Greenland is big. And then I'm doing one, which it could be the retrospective, but it's the best of uh, my work and uh, what I'm doing. I have one also on grizzly bears and brown bears and polar bears and then abstract buildings. So those are projects that I'm continually working on. And I'm glad that I finally got this Rust project done. Um, I think Rust kind of tells a story. Uh, you can see your own story in each piece of Rust that you look at. You'll see a whole lot of those in a second. It's a transition. Uh, uh, Rust was something brand new and well painted at one point. And over a period of time, uh, you begin to appreciate that uh, nature claims everything back if you want. But I also see Rust as an abstract, it takes on a whole new look. and um, it's everywhere you go, you just have to look for it. Uh, but I find that most of my best rust pictures have come from the Arctic regions, which is kind of weird, but uh, there's something about Arctic rust. So um, what I'm doing with this um, kind of obsession is I'm making a series of fine art prints. I'm doing photo tins, uh, which is a, a collection of images that you can put in these little tins that you pass around. I'll be working on a specialized zine uh, probably another book from Blurb, and uh, of course I've been doing social media shares, and I'm may be doing some greeting cards. It's another project uh, we've started a video on, and uh, working with Red River Paper on, is uh, making greeting cards. So you'll see a little bit more about that. But uh, recently, um, I had as a guest at my house uh, Brooks Jensen from uh, Lenswork, and while he was there, he and I worked on a one of his bonus editions of Rust, and that's now out and available on PDF. Uh, I will have an article up on that with the links to it uh, very soon. So that's a lot of images uh, that I took, a lot of which you'll see here in this presentation coming up in the next minute. So um, just so you can see where things are when I make my prints, and I'm a firm believer in the prints, and that you really don't have a photograph until you have a print that you can hold in your hands. Uh, there's something tactile about that, and you know, being from the old school where we had to shoot a, a negative and then make a print to actually have a photograph, I still believe that's true. And, uh, you know, so many people just put their images up on the web and the cloud and let them sit there. I, and that's not the way I do it. So um, in my house, I'm very fortunate that Deborah gave me the basement, which I turned into a man cave, as you can see here, with a lot of paper and printers. There's two printers, three, actually three printers down there, one in my office also, and uh, constantly uh, working on things. The stuff on the floor there are products that uh, I'm working on reviews on and so forth. Uh, you can see this is one of my work areas where I have a, um, a, a pen tablet for retouching. Uh, on the right hand side there is a printer all of you should have is a PM400 by Epson. It prints 4x6 and 5x7 images and it's kind of that uh, kind of printer that you can do snapshots on that you take and just wirelessly send them off to the printer to have them made. And then on the left hand side is the uh, P700 and be directly behind that is the Epson P900. And uh, you can see a close up of these printers right here. <clears throat> this is my studio at the Indianapolis Art Center. I've been very fortunate 
to uh, be a, an artist in residence there. It's an amazing facility, a lot of great energy and a lot of interesting art studios that are there. And uh, I occupy the, the, the digital art one. And you can see it's a rather good size. Jeff Shewey's sitting there over at the table in the picture. So it's a very big location that can be transformed into shooting areas, teaching areas, printing areas. It's um, very fortunate. And we have a computer lab as well as an analog darkroom attached to these rooms. So it's pretty cool. And you can see this is some of the uh, images from one of our printing workshops uh, going on where we look at a lot of different things as far as how to print and what to print. And as uh, all the printing workshops, we do a reception at my house. And uh, this is taken looking down in the living room as we enjoy some glasses of wine and uh, talk about photography and so forth. So it's uh, a good time to be a little more casual and have a great chat. <clears throat> so what we're going to be looking at a lot of images. I'm going to move fast. You can always uh, get the playback and or download the PDF Rust book when I publish it. Um, so uh, let's let's get rolling on this and I'm going to do a, a running dialogue on uh, what you're looking at. <clears throat> So I, I look everywhere, and I think as you go through life, you'll look everywhere, and you'll find rusty things all over the place. And uh, I think rust is really cool because, number one, it's got a great color, and it, and it reproduces very well. And uh, it, it just has a story to, to say with everything you do. Um, you know, this is a rusty um, uh, mill of, that I found at a junkyard. Uh, that's a rusty uh, tank in Antarctica, as well as these. These are all... Uh, whale oil tanks at a um, whale oil um, factory kind of place on Deception Island. And this is looking up inside the rusty tank um, where they would one time store nothing but whale oil in there. Tin roofs, beautiful textures. And, you know, you find locks and look at the rust on the, the, uh, the lock, it's the, the, the locking mechanism itself. So I'm just always finding these things as I look around. This is uh, tracks from a, uh, an old snow tractor uh, that were just bundled up and left where they are. Uh, another close-up of them. I kind of like the abstract kind of feel. Uh, as you can see, if you kind of look around and just kind of look and play with the compositions, you can come up with some great pictures. But one of the things that I really like about photographing rust is you can see that kind of the rust begins to fall off in layers, it takes on a whole dimension and then uh, algae and moss grow to it and it becomes its own living kind of entity and also makes for great abstract uh, photography. <clears throat> and you can just kind of, your eye kind of wanders around and of course, uh, with the megapixel cameras we have now, the sharpness in these is just incredible. You can zoom in and look at them all, and they make great prints when they're put on the wall. As what I find when I do print these, that if I make a 24 by 30 or 30 by 40 and put them up on the wall, people tend to kind of see them and walk and immerse themselves in the prints, which is, I think, really important. It kind of becomes immersive uh, photography because people want to see the details in the image and, you know, explore around and try to see the, the, the many different things because you can see there's a lot going on in that, uh, that image. And, you know, this is a rusty bolt. Um, in one time, this was probably shiny and painted nice, but uh, over the many years, you can see that the rusty bolts and the rivets that are behind it have just kind of disintegrated and go away. And uh, you can see some of the amazing colors. And you know, with a shot like this when you're photographing it, you not only photograph this like at this angle, but up in the upper left corner you'll see that there's a, a special area with some blue and you can you know, go in on some macro work and uh, create a whole bunch of other abstracts and images as you go. <clears throat> I'm always trying to keep in mind the compositions, the horizontals, the verticals, and how the shapes play into it. And, um, you know, then you look for certain things that are just objects. You know, here you've got this rusty um, valve knob, I guess it is, you know, sitting next to a, a seashell that was probably dropped there uh, by a seagull, kind of a yin-yang kind of thing. 
And sometimes you'll see that, you know, the rust gets to a point where it's rusted through and uh, you begin to take on a whole new look and things about space and it becomes very brittle. And you find a lot of different things with rust. This is a broken valve, but all rusted out. This is a boiler um, and you can see right through it. It's just gorgeous color rust. You know, and this is a nice abstract of the rust. So you get some really cool stuff along the way. And, you know, you got this rusty picture, but you got a couple drops of green in there. No idea where they came from, why they're still there when everything else is rotting away. But uh, it does kind of make for kind of fun stuff. And, you know, this is an old engine block at a junkyard. <clears throat> and you can just see that it's got rust, but kind of takes on its whole new look at the same time. Old crank uh, area for a doorknob. Big old trucks sitting in the middle of a junkyard field. You know, more rusty patterns. And this is inside a, a old pickup truck, and you can see everything is just rusting away and peeling away and, you know, being reclaimed by nature. Um, this is an old tractor seat that uh, somebody put on a wall, and then they were draping uh, rope over it kind of as a, as a rope holder. But it, I love the shape and the... the how symmetrical it is. And then this is the uh, grain silos up in, in Buffalo at Silo City. And of course, all these conveyors and so forth are rusted in the way the light and all the different textures work. You know, you have a great picture that you can explore and see a lot of. It's one of my favorite places. And I like the shadows that are made with it on the right hand side. Uh, this is a little more close up of the, one of the same areas. As I say, a lot of times, these are what I call picture in pictures. Um, you know, the, the, the point of this photograph is, you know, you got this big mechanical monstrosity there in the background, and it got all these beautiful ducks floating around in front of you. So uh, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> and of course, don't forget, you can take it and make it black and white. It still kind of shows up and looks like rust, but it takes on a whole new meaning when you go into the black and white side of things. Um, there is something about black and white that's just really special. You can see the back and forth of the same shot. This is also Silo City up, up high, and you can see just everything is rusting. It's all rusting. <clears throat> uh, the connections for two railroad cars. This is the hood of a car. I guess there, there was a car called a Commodore at one point, but uh, you can see uh, the Commodore 8, big old eight-cylinder engine. There's uh, another car emblem for Chrysler. This is uh, also on Deception Island, uh, part of the, the offices and the buildings, and you can see that it's rusting away and, uh, and more of the processing place. There probably was a building around that at one time uh, that had burnt down, but uh, all this stuff is just sitting out there. And then you got rusty hinges. Got to love a rusty hinge. <clears throat> a series of them here. And then you got rust that is like uh, forming around areas that were heavily painted or decaled. And uh, they kind of form their own look and, and feel, as you can see here. <clears throat> the rusty mechanical parts just lying on the ground, old, old wheels. Um, the, this was a, a steam engine plant that powered the quarry uh, mechanism for bringing gypsum uh, out of the ground in the Salbard Arctic region. And you kind of see that you've got this beautiful landscape and these monstrosities sit in the middle of this really picture, picturesque landscape. More knobs and dials and gears. You know, this was a screw gear, and uh, it's all rusted. Um, this one actually has been successful. I sold this a couple times, and it's quite, quite pretty. <clears throat> More blocks. Old stove that was sitting out there. Kind of cool.
So, Kevin, are most of these made in direct hard sunlight or does overcast sometimes work for these? Overcast photos? sometimes when you don't see the shadows, a lot of it, especially in the Arctic regions, is, is a lot of overcast. Um, when the sun hits the tanks, and you'll see some shortly, uh, it makes for some beautiful transitional light. So, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, nature begins to reclaim all of this. And at one time, these were, you know, interesting man made machines that were engineered and just have, you know, a lot of cool stuff going on with them. And I kind of just like to look and play with the compositions in the viewfinder when I'm shooting pictures like this to see if I can get uh, a, a different kind of look, as you can see here. And then some things begin to rust so, so much that, you know, they just begin to, you know, flake away and become part of the earth. There are some images that I shot recently in Greenland that aren't part of this presentation. And it was at an old Air Force base that was abandoned that they had used during World War II to uh, refuel airplanes on their way from America to Europe. And you kind of had to fly down this fjord system and land at this airport. And there's got to be thousands upon thousands of 55 gallon rusted drums, lots of trucks, um, a whole slew of different things that are just rotting away there that never were recovered after the war. Um, it's well hidden, but you know, when you go there, it's, it's quite something to see that at one time there were thousands of people at that location. And uh, now there's nothing but uh, remnants and rust and old vehicles that are abandoned. Um, quite spectacular. And you know, you can see how this rust and the things play into the, the whole image. This one is, uh, been one of my favorite pictures. I've used it quite a bit, and I've sold it quite a bit. Um, it it kind of comes out really cool looking with the gears and the, the paint. And that's uh, the gears from some sort of steam shovel uh, that so that it can rotate around. There you can see a, a, a picture of that a little more. So remember, this is like the close-up picture in a picture of what you see there. And you can see those gears at the bottom. Another shot of that. This is a hand cranked uh, winch that uh, lowered everything down off a cliff so that uh, it could um, go into a, a boat, I suppose, and the buckets they used to, to send them down. This is a, 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 a port, uh, I guess it was bolted onto a big tank. And a lot of times in this case, there was a snow going on while we was photographing on some of these tanks. And you can see the way the snow sits on top of this rust and kind of adds its own texture to it and a contrast of textures. Uh, you know, once again, playing around with rusty bolts and close-ups and gears and more bolts. So, you know, all that was taken from that one tank. These are a series of other storage tanks. I kind of like the pattern uh, that this snow played on this tank. And um, these bolts, I think, are always fun to see, you know, rusty bolts like that. And another bolt. So yeah, at one time, really these were, these time, at one time, these things were functional. Now it's, they're just disintegrating. So it's, uh, what I find interesting is, you know, as man, we just kind of make these places and eventually you just throw this stuff out and leave it sit. And, you know, that's where, where you have it. You know, big valves and another boiler for processing whales up in uh, the, the Faroe Islands. Do you find things rust differently in salty conditions versus more drier areas? Uh, yeah, like I said, I think you find always the rust changes. But for some reason or other, the rust in the polar regions has its own kind of feel towards it. You know, I can, I can do a junkyard here in Indianapolis and find a lot of rust, but I find that uh, rust in the polar regions, and Antarctica is pretty dry continent, but I guess there's still moisture there, but it just forms a different mm -hmm. kind of rust. Maybe it was the metal or the iron they used when they made it, but yeah. I always found it pretty well, fascinating. Five images back, that stuff that really flakes, where do you find a lot of that? Like that? Yeah, that's on some... No, keep going. Yeah, this stuff. Right there? Yeah, this really flaky. Yeah, I am. 
it, it kind of mm-hmm. just flakes away. I, part of it, I was told, was back at one point they didn't manufacture um, metal very well. Rust, you know, ships would. Uh, this would happen a lot on ships and ships would become weakened and then holes would burst open and mm-hmm. so forth. So, you know, apparently there's a sign, a, a, a technique of, you know, processing iron and steel that, that works. At one point, these are probably strong bolts, but you can see the, the washer on the bolt and the screw, you can no longer has threads mm-hmm. and you're just missing everything along there and, you know, everything's rotted through. Right. You know, these are more, you know, kind of newer stuff, but they're just kind of thrown on the ground and left there. And who knows if they'll ever be picked up. So, you know, once again, looking always for more stuff. And sometimes I like to put the environment into the picture, as you see here, uh, you know, where there's a house. And uh, this was um, a sharpening wheel. So these were sharpening wheels that they would sharpen these giant tools on that they would then end up cutting open whales with. Um, so uh, this is all at a whaling station. And, you know, this is your standard corrugated metal, but you can see mm-hmm. once rust begins to happen, it just is like a cancer and it spreads and eventually, you know, it disintegrates on top of itself and uh, no rhyme or reason. And you can see at one point, there's probably a quarter of inch of metal that has flaked off of this one tank that's probably an inch and a half thick. And of course, you know, I always find it amazing that, you know, nature kind of just finds a way to pop in on some of this stuff and take up residence. You know, these are uh, cleats on a, on a pier, you know, where seawater splashing on them over all the years have made them kind of unique and special. And, you know, I like to, in a shot like this, there's a blue dot. What is that blue dot in the center? Where did that come from? And how did that survive? This is uh, whale oil tanks. And John, this, this is where you see when light starts playing off the tanks uh, and you, you kind of work it right, you really can come out with some very subtle and really nice photographs. Um, so when the sun does come out, it, it really lights up this rust and it takes on a whole nother level. And you can see here, this is in South Georgia Island, where a lot of the seals have just uh, taken up residence in these old abandoned uh, factories and just kind of live amongst man-made man's stuff. The treatise. You know, and just kind of a close-up of a seal with all the rust in the background kind of just says, you know, this is the the transition, you know, while nature is taking over the metal and destroying and, you know, deteriorating the metal, you know, the other part of the nature finds it uh, a habitat. These are old whaling ships that we've been beached and just, you know, left to rot. And you can see them, you know, against the hillside with the oil, whale oil tanks in the background. You know, they, this was in a bay and they would say the bay would just be pure red when they were slaughtering whales. So just the, the amount of whales they process in these facilities um, were just amazing. And I do have a movie on this. This is a place called Gravikin, uh, which is in South Georgia Island. You can see the harpoon um, cannon on the front of that ship. This is an old boat um, that once again is rotted away. It looks like it might have had some burnt, but you know the nails have managed to survive as you know, other parts of the, the, the structure have deteriorated. And, you know, once again, some more things with gears, pipes and other rusty metal, an old wrench that was just left sitting there. Now, the close up of the side of the whaling ship kind of just like to once again, focus in on certain parts of the big picture and uh, begin to enjoy that a, a big old tank, everything's rusted away. And I don't think I would trust that ladder going up it, but it really mm-hmm. adds a, a contrast to everything else you see on these tanks. Valves and manhole covers and, you know, probably a label in there at one point of what was inside this tank. And, you know, some of the tanks in the facility, you can see some of the tanks are actually collapsing on themselves um, for whatever reason. And, you know, if you get in tight with a long lens, you can shoot through there and kind of has a lot of things to explore with the eye as you you see all this stuff. 
And then, uh, you know, of course, in contrast, you have a kind of a tarred over type of valve plugged into a rusty tank and, you know, another part of a collapsed tank where you just have the ladder and, you know, it just kind of fell apart. And of course, the other thing that, you know, is on top of a lot of this rust at one point is paint. So you might get peeling paint like this, which I find probably is a whole other topic I could go around and photograph is peeling paint. Once again, light playing through these tanks, machinery, chain links, and that's uh, Deborah wandering around, just kind of give an idea for the size. Um, she's accompanied me on a number of these trips to Antarctica, and uh, you know she enjoys photographing this as much as I do. So, uh, but there's just loads of things you can find and, and take pictures of that are rusty. Hmm. This is another friend named Kevin, and uh, you know, same sort of thing. Just exploring the area, finding your own pictures. Which, you know, whether you go long or short or close up, there's just a ton of stuff to to look at. And you know, I find it's interesting too that moss and algae and different growth and things. I actually have one picture somewhere where I have a, a little plant growing out of the uh, rusty kind of dirt that. Uh, you know, deteriorated from a boxcar. And you can see there's a tractor tire, and what they would do is they would take these um, tracks and bolt them over the tractor tires to make treaded vehicles that they could go over snow and uh, sand with. This is in the Palouse. Um, somebody took a rusty old pulley that was part of a grain silo and painted a happy face on it. I thought that was kind of cute. This is an um, old ship whaling ship that just got abandoned in a bay in um, South Georgia Island and home of a lot of birds, as you can see. But the rust on this ship is some of the finest rust I've ever photographed and has provided me like this, some of the best abstract uh, rusty pictures that I've ever done. Um, just, they're just, they make beautiful prints. You really need to, to see one where you can go in and see the ultra close-ups and the textures of these um, things and um, just, you know, beautiful, beautiful stuff like this. Yeah. So we just took the Zodiac and went up and down the ship and, you know, I stood and sat and did all sorts of pictures uh, that come up with what you're looking at here. So it's a lot of fun. Some more stuff here. So, now this is in Brazil. Um, no, Brazil, uh, Buenos Aires. So um, Michael Reichman, Chris Sanderson, and I, and another, another person, chartered a, a boat for a day and went along the river in Buenos Aires. Uh, actually, uh, there was a network of these little rivers. And you know, here's an old tugboat that one day just pushed this big barge that you see there. And somebody just left it, and they've never come back to it. And it's just sitting there and, uh, you know, stories to be told. And this is looking through one of the portholes and uh, kind of love the way that designed itself. It's an old rusty truck in Death Valley. I was back in my grunge days, you know, using HDR grunge. Uh, another kind of shot where it kind of HDR grunged it, but this was sits out in the middle of the desert in Death Valley. And here you've got tanks like you know vehicle tanks these were in antarctica mm -hmm. and if you look at the engine it's not your normal v8 or straight engine it's a rotary aircraft engine they rotary. used and uh, these would go all over the place on the snow and uh, explore and then one day they just kind of parked them where you see them and they never moved since but they do make you know great pictures of you know these old beasts coming out of the snow and you know into the environment like that And then, you know, of course, take this, you know, you get the overall shot, which is not bad. But then as you start moving in, you find all sorts of uh, more what I would, you know, once again, term picture in a picture. Rusty tanks in Death Valley, an old spring. And I like the way the spring plays on the sunshine and the, the uh, shadows, you know, creating its own kind of um, image that way. Old rusty furnaces left out in the middle of nowhere. Close up of a rusty bolt. 
in the side of another tank than Salvard. So you can see these are very abstracty. So it's it's you know I, I'm a I, you know I've been a portrait photographer and a high end portrait photographer and I uh, did celebrities and then I did you know products and you know I love the landscape but I love exploring things like this which challenge you and take you out of some place that's a comfort zone and allows you to explore and see in different ways you know just the water on that uh, pipe there and the rust and you know there's just got its own kind of feel towards things. And, you know, once again, we, we talk about the rusty and peeling paint as uh, the deterioration begins. This is on a box car, an old train yard. These are some more box cars and trains. So, you, you know, you can go out and, and explore and find these amazing locations um, that allow you to, to be artistic and have some fun. This one is another one. Actually, it was um, used as a background for a magazine ad, which was kind of cool. A lot of color and stuff in that. It's also sold a lot of prints of that. So it's pretty, one, I don't know why, but it's just one that people tend to like. I guess it's because it's got a bunch more color in it. So you've just had a, a glimpse of things, of uh, some of my oh, rust. Great. And um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. If you do, unmute your microphone. I'm happy to, to answer those for you. So Bob Peterson posted something in the chat there uh, from CNN published. What is it like to live in one of the most remote places on earth? What is life like? What is the remote place, Bob? You're muted, so. Salbard. Salbard, yeah. Um, I've been to Salbard a dozen, probably a dozen times. Um, usually we go into Longyear Baron and uh, charter, I charter a ship and we do photo workshops, photographing around the islands. That's why I got some of that rust from that area and also photographing uh, whales and polar bears and Arctic fox and walrus. Um, Salbard is not on any of my workshops anymore because the country of Norway, because of over tourism, uh, has put new restrictions on how close you can get to wildlife and certain things. And um, it just... It doesn't allow for the kind of photography that uh, we used to walk out of Salbard with. I'm talking polar bear encounters that, you know, you're, you're 50 feet away from them and uh, it just amazing photographs that you can take. Uh, polar bears on the ice and the walrus, you know, where, you know, we used to be close and now there are new rules where you have to be, you know, 100 to, uh, to 500 yards away from any of the wildlife. So even the longest lenses won't allow you to uh, photograph those. So all of a sudden, all these guys that were running ship tours in Salbard, as well as Greenland, because Greenland put in new rules too, which I, I no longer go to Greenland anymore, um, because they, they want to push the tourism away, um, which is kind of weird because they make a lot of money on the tourism. But when it gets overcrowded on tourism, it becomes a real hassle. Like if you go to Iceland, uh, you know, when I went to Iceland and started doing workshops there back in 2004 and you know for many many years uh you know it was a dirt road around the island and you could just stop anywhere and at any guest house and uh, find a room and a meal and now there are so many tourists and buses you know you might pull up to a location and beautiful icebergs on the beach and you think you're all alone and then in five seconds you get two buses pull up and you know it's 100 people on the beach all trying to walk around with their iphones and ipads uh, taking photographs. Um, so it, it's really hard uh, to, to go to these places anymore. Um, so uh, it's, it's just, it's different. That's all I can. Different, just, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it is what it is. Uh, if you probably read the newspapers too, if you were going as a tourist to Spain this year, the residents of you know, Barcelona were walking around with water pistols, squirting tourists because there was just so much tourism. Even though they need it to survive, it's so bad they can't live with it. So, um, you know, they're, they're now tacking on extra charges and different things along that. Of course, you know, my secret to doing those cities and different locations is to uh, visit locations out of season. So, uh, you know, 
go go early, go late, and um, you know these cities are amazing places, but uh, you kind of have to go when nobody else is there. So try to avoid the crowds. Do, does anybody else have any questions or anything like that? I haven't seen anything else come in. All right. But that was a lot of fun. I saw a lot of faces in a lot of your, a lot of the images yeah. too. I keep seeing faces and things, maybe because I do a lot of portraits. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your portrait work is absolutely amazing. Well, thank you. So uh, if anybody else doesn't have anything, we'll just say, you know, we got it. You saw some rust. Um, I'll have a recording mm -hmm. of this up online in the next week or so. Um, I hope mm -hmm. to be able to post the information about Drew Hendricks and Red River as early as tomorrow, if time allows. And um, uh, we'll see you in two weeks at another photo chat. So I appreciate the... Thanks, Kevin. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. I really Beautiful. enjoyed that. Cool. All right. Well, look, everybody, have a, a, a happy day. Make the best of it. Uh, for all of those that are suffering hangover from the election and trying to figure out where the world's going to go from here, I guess all I can say is that we're all in it together and somehow or rather, yeah. you know, we'll come out of this and uh, we'll, we'll be okay, I, I hope, you know. Um, uh, it's, good. it's different times, that's for sure. All right, everybody, take Let's care. Appreciate you, know. you coming by and um, I'm turning off. See you my Till next time. Till next time. Take care. See ya.